So you'll want to create a new week five project. <clears throat> and then um, there were two files. There were these two files. You'll want to load them up into Ghidra. And just spoiler alert, it's basically the same, it's basically the same code. The one thing that um, you'll notice here is that this IP address value is different. And, um, and so if you bring up the defined strings view after you load that up in Ghidra, that would be really helpful for you because in this particular example, um, that value is readily available. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to save this value over here in my notes. I'd like to keep track of it. Um, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I will just save the machine state for my Kali VM really quick. Um, and because I'm going to switch over to my Windows VM. So I'm going to shut this one down and I'm going to switch over to my Windows VM. So the point of this is that I wanted to extract some of the information that I learned about looking at the malware sample. And then I'm going to use uh, the debugger. I'm going to basically try and run it within the Windows VM. Uh, so I know that this thing tries to communicate out to this IP address. Uh, what I want to do is I want to try and figure out what is it trying to do when it does that. So the first step to that is trying to run it and getting it to, communi to communicate to that IP address. So I've got it in here. Um, hopefully in the past um, couple days, I'll be able to pull down this. Specifically this one and get that installed. And then I'll just see show of hands. Um, who was it? Who went through uh, any of these? So the debugger analysis. There was a um, uh, there's a PDF from Sans that had a, a walkthrough using these three examples. Did anyone get a chance to? try any of those. Okay, so um, we won't walk through any of those examples right now, but what I'll do is I'll kind of do the same thing um, on this VM. So, so for those of you who have pulled uh, this thing uh, in, <clears throat> It basically has a dynamic tools folder. You can either extract the entire thing to the system, which is what I did, um, or you can, say, grab the immunity debugger setup and you can just drag it out. Either way, um, you'll want to install immunity debugger. It should take about like 15, 20 seconds. And it, doesn't re it didn't require a reboot of the system on my computer. <clears throat> so 
So once you have that, once you have that installed, um, and you have these two copied into the VM as well, um, I've been using the shared folders here. This will look different for those of you on Windows systems, but I've been using the shared folders here to basically um, take one of the folders I have and map it over. So using this, I point to a folder, you know, like that. I can give it a folder path and then I can give it a folder name and then it will make it available on here and it makes it look like a network drive or a, um, not a network drive, it makes it look like a uh, network share. So VBox SVR ends up having all of the folders that you share over. So you can share as many as you want. Um, so that's, that should, um, that stuff's in documentation from earlier weeks, but I figure I'll throw it out here um, for anyone who doesn't want to have to go and jump in, back into the documentation right now. Um, so I pulled it out, you know, I've been basically loading everything in here and pulling it over. <clears throat> so once we have that over, um, once we have that over, I'm going to do probably the most important step, which is I'm going to take a snapshot of this. Before running the malware. So that when I do this, I can very quickly <clears throat> restore back to, say, the pre run state, right? So I can guarantee that I have a nice vanilla system or more or less clean system that's also set up for analysis um, to revert back to, or basically a known state, right? Um, and that's one of the other key um, things to keep in mind with doing malware analysis is making sure that. Um, you always figure out, okay, how can I save my environment almost like a lab and then revert back to that very quickly. So now that I've done that, um, what I can do is I can actually load, I can just drop this into the debugger. So I can drag and drop. Um, so immunity debugger is really nice that way. So don't run it yet. So one thing I will say, like Immunity Debugger's uh, interface um, isn't as clean as uh, some of the others. So I increased the font size. Uh, now that makes it look like a bunch of the text overlaps with each other. Uh, that's mainly just because the columns don't have um, really pretty looking uh, uh, bars and stuff like that. <clears throat> But this address up here might look familiar to some of you um, from when we first looked at this file. Uh, that was the entry point that was um, uh, that that we saw when we ran um, when uh, when we ran OBJ dump on it the first time, like way back when. Uh, and I was using the last program to kind of jump around the disassembly of the file. Um, so, you know, I I compiled the same file here, so you're seeing the same entry point. Um, so what, uh, you know, what uh, Immunity Debugger did is it jumped right there um, for us. Um, one of the reasons we're not doing this in Ghidra is because Ghidra doesn't offer a uh, debugger at all. So I can't actually run any programs within Ghidra. I can only analyze programs on disk. Um, so the next thing I'm going to do is... Um, <clears throat> I'm going to go over here to the network settings. Um, you can do this while it's running, so you don't have to shut the system down. I'm going to make sure this goes back to host only adapter. And then the other thing that I'm going to do um, that's uh, really important is um, this uh, promiscuous mode. So I'm going to tell it to allow all. And what that does is it allows um, any of the basically any of the devices that are connected to this host-only adapter uh, will be able to see the network traffic. 
I'm going to save those settings, and you'll see the the network adapter will go offline like it did. Um, if it doesn't do that, and I found that sometimes Windows doesn't do this very well, um, you can just disconnect. So you click this button, and then you can click it again, and then it'll reconnect, and then it'll work. And it should already have a um, yeah, it should already have an IP address. It just doesn't have internet access, which is fine. So the next thing I'm going to do um, <clears throat> is, uh, and those of you, uh, if you want to, you can do this from the Windows machine, um, or, for, or I should, should say you can do it from your host system. So you can do it from the command line in Linux. Um, you can use Wireshark if you want. Um, you can use Wireshark on Windows if you want. Uh, or you can use Kali and just make sure it's connected to the same host base network. Um, if you want, I know some of the students were having trouble running um, multiple VMs a lot and having it keep up. Uh, so, <clears throat> um, you know, one way to avoid that problem is to just use, um, say, network analysis tools and stuff like that on the host. Um, so, what I'm going to do is uh, <clears throat> I'm going to do, uh, you know, I'm going to do TCP dump. So um, with TCP dump, what I want to do is I want to have it show me the uh, network traffic um, that's coming from that adapter. Uh, with Wireshark, it'll be similar to this, but I believe you'll open up a window and then you'll have a choice to choose the virtual box, virtual networking adapter. Um, but in Kali, you'll be able to do something like this, except it'll be, um, it'll be like ETH0 or something. And I can actually bring it up really quickly. So yeah, it'll be ETH zero. So so I'm gonna monitor it. Um, I usually give it dash n just so it doesn't try to do a bunch of DNS lookups. So normally TCP dump, if it gets an IP address, it'll try and look it up to find out if it has a name. I don't really care about having to do that, so I'm not gonna have it do that. And then the last thing that you can do is you can give it a um, what's called a filter string, which basically allows you to narrow down the packets that it's looking for. Um, a lot of times for something like this, I'll narrow it down to TCP packets. So then I'm going to go ahead and run it, and down in the lower right-hand corner over here, over there, um, you'll see the uh, uh, you'll see that it says it's running. Um, I'll be able to go here to Task Manager, and I can verify that. Immunity debuggers running, and then RBW is running. You can see that RBW is taking up a lot of CPU as well. Um, I can pause execution if I want, uh, and then it'll um, it'll pause somewhere um, wherever it happened to be executing at the time. Uh, one of the nice things about this is that um, <clears throat> uh, while it's running. Um, immunity debugger gets to not only see the executable, but the it also gets to see all the DLLs that um, that executable works on, which is something that, say, in the current deployment of Ghidra that everyone's using here, you don't necessarily have access to that, um, nor do you have access to any DLLs that um, may have been uh, manually loaded, so not encoded within the EXE, but actually manually loaded at runtime, which is another thing you can do in Windows. Is um, and We'll see malware that does it a lot, which is the file won't have any imports for its um, DLLs. Um, it'll actually have code that's hard-coded 
to manually load those DLLs in memory at runtime. Immunity debugger is nice in that it gives you access to all of those things. So I paused it. <clears throat> I can click on, let's see, I can click on the E, and E will show me the EXE, so it, um, it's called the modules or the executables view. Um, and it shows me the EXE, and it also shows me all the DLLs that have been loaded. Um, and you'll have to forgive me, I cannot remember the significance of the red versus the green, um, but um, that's not a significant, uh, it's not a significant thing to, uh, to jump into right now. Um, the other thing that you can see with it is, um, if you remember, the program, the original entry point, so not the entry point from, uh, not the funky entry point that I gave you in, um, in week four's lab, um, but the original one that we went over in class is right here. So you can see that the way that it laid out this program's memory is it put the program right here. And so those are all the addresses that you're exploring in Ghidra. Um, but then also, Windows has created a bunch of memory here for various things. And so in this case, it has um, some aspect of the hard disk volume is mapped over here. Or not the hard disk volume, but the, uh, let's see, yeah, the, so this NLS file is mapped here. Um, and then there's another sort default down there. Um, and then down here, if you keep scrolling down, you can actually see where each one of the libraries are loaded as well. So it is able to show you where all the libraries got loaded. And I can actually go and start reverse engineering the individual libraries. Um, for instance, in that message box case, um, if I wanted to, I could follow the execution of message box. So I will start running this again. <clears throat> and you'll notice we're not getting anything here. So we're not getting any results or anything right now. Yeah. Uh, I just wondered, so can you do run the command uh, Which commands did I run before I did what? Um, no. So... So what I did was I dragged this onto the debugger icon, and then it loaded it up. Oh, um, the purpose of making it host only was because uh, that way I can get, um, sorry, I can get visibility right here using the TCP dump command. So I can attach TCP dump to the virtual box network adapter. So or Wireshark if you wanted to use Wireshark. So. Um, I actually don't think I have Wireshark installed on this laptop, but um, hypothetically, I could also be doing it in here, and I think I actually do have Wireshark in here. Yeah. So I could load up Wireshark here as well. Let me double check and make sure I have the host only networking set here. So. And then that'll give you um, do this. So, but the goal is really just to uh, to be able to spot network traffic. Um, one thing I will add is uh, you know you've got access to all these data structures. I'm going to go back to the. Um, CPU menu. So if you ever lose the the program's disassembly, you can go back here to the CPU menu. Uh, it allows you to kind of step forward. Um, so I can you know, use those to step forward. I'm, I started it running again, so it's actually running in the background. <clears throat> so the other thing that you um, run into when you're trying to run a program is that um, like in this case, I'm not getting any network traffic. And that's where we go back to this IP address is what I grabbed. So that IP address needs to be accessible. 
um, to this VM. So what I'll have to do is I'll have to open up this and try and see what IP address is here and what's the net mask. And then one of the important things that I learned as well is that uh, VirtualBox doesn't always give me a default gateway. Um, so if this host um, right now is trying to talk to an IP address that's like 192.168.12, which is the case over here, uh, what's going to happen is Windows itself is going to say that address is not inside of the network that I have access to. It's not, it's not one of the addresses that's in the network that I'm plugged into. And also, I don't know who to talk to to try to communicate with that system. So what you'll need to do, um, and you'll need to do this in Linux too, but the commands are different in Linux, um, is you'll have to go in to the uh, network operations here, network options here, and go to advanced. So you, basically the goal is you want to populate this, but you still want the automatic setting of these two. Um, you can't do that with the simple view here, but if you go into advanced, you can add a default gateway. Uh, what I have found is that, um, and this is where having, um, you know, having one of these other machines that are connected to it to do the capture is very helpful. So um, what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to do it from Kali here. So let me just... Uh, Let me see if this has the uh, correct. Yeah, so this has the correct IP address. Um, if you want this machine to try to communicate, to basically send its packets to the other to another machine, what you have to do is you have to set that machine as the default gateway. So what I'm going to do in my Windows machine is I'm going to set my Kali VM as the default gateway. And as I said, if you don't want to run the two VMs, you don't have to. You can do the same exercise using Windows Wireshark. You just have to give your Windows hosts like virtual, virtual box adapter, you have to give it 192.168.56 IP um, as the default gateway. And then you should have something that looks like this. And what that'll do is if now Windows in, in the Windows 7 VM, and it actually automatically pop, it populates it there for you, Windows 7 inside of the VM will then assume that if the IP address that is trying that is trying to communicate with isn't a neighbor, that it needs to um, uh, basically um, tell that machine that you just gave it. It needs to send a copy of the packet to that machine. Yeah. It'll be the IP address that you're running um, uh, Wireshark on or TCP dump. So you'll have to look that up. That's going to differ for each one of your environments because that'll be randomly assigned. So it's regular? Yeah. So if you're in Kali and you want to use Kali, if you just do IP adder like that, then you should have it. So, what would the process be set if you're running Wireshark on the host and then the host machine? Yeah. So is that Windows host? No. Oh, Linux host? Yeah. You should be able to run this same command. You just have to run it from a terminal on the Linux host. And then you'll look for the, um, I'll do it right here. You will look for. You'll, yeah, you'll look for this right here, right? The VBox net zero. So then what I'm going to do is I'm going to, so this button right here um, in immunity, 
uh, it looks like the rewind button. Um, that uh, that button basically um, kills the program, so stops pro program execution, and then reloads the program from disk as if we had just started uh, started before. And I've found that uh, that button you use a lot if you happen to. Um, you know, we'll get in later on to more advanced examples of actually like editing programs while they're running, so that we can kind of work around um, obfuscation and work around. Um, say checks and or say debugging checks and things like that. Um, if you happen to edit the wrong bytes, uh, you can use that button to kind of undo everything and go back to the beginning. Or if you happen to, um, so another thing you can do with this is you can walk the program, say one instruction at a time like this. If I happen to run past something that has data that I want to look at, I can't really go back. There's no control Z here, but I can kind of reset the program with the rewind button and then we'll go back to the beginning and then I can try my steps over again. So now we'll see. Yep. Okay. <clears throat> So now when I restarted the program, you can see that that IP address is now showing up here. When I, before, uh, when, I was, uh, when I was trying to monitor the traffic, I wasn't seeing anything. And so basically what I did was I told the Windows program to send a copy of all those packets to me. So then the next thing I want to do <clears throat> is I want to, um, yeah, the next thing I want to do is I want to have it um, redirect. I want to try and have it redirect all those packets to maybe a port on this system that I can listen on. And that's where this um, IP tables um, IP tables can be really helpful for this. And what I'll do is um, oops, capital oops. Okay. That's mainly me just trying to make sure that I can see um, that IP tables is running. Um, so. Spirit of full disclosure, I can't memorize everything um, other than the basic tools needed to do the job. Um, so I can do this though, redirect IP tables traffic to TCP port. <clears throat> and uh, what this gives you the ability to do, or I should say this is a nice recipe that I use, is um, I'd like to redirect incoming traffic from a particular source. So in this case, this thing said, I'd like to redirect all traffic from a particular source to the localhost IP address um, and the um, destination port. So basically anything from here that's trying to send to this destination port, I want it to go to, uh, let's see, Sorry. Yeah, anything that's coming from any IP address that's going to localhost on this port, I want it to go to here. So I want it to go to port 88. So I'm going to take a copy of this. Yeah, and it actually goes and explains it right here. So I can double check that my uh, interpretation of this is correct. So I'm going to take a version of this. I'm going to just copy out of here. Um, and I'll make sure that this makes it onto kind of like the summary notes that I publish on the website as well. Um,
<clears throat> so I want to modify this for my particular um, situation here, right? So if I go back up here, um, the other thing that um, I'm being shown here in black is that, um, so Wireshark does a nice job of highlighting the errors out to you. So all of this other stuff is kind of normal traffic, and so it doesn't highlight it to me. But this stuff right here is traffic that didn't get a response. And so it's like, hey, you want to look at this because it's the traffic that didn't get a response and it's um, TCP traffic as well, so it was expecting a response. So what I can see is it's coming from this source IP, it's going to this destination IP, and it is trying to communicate to port 444. And then these are basically it trying again. So what I can do is I can say if the destination is that malicious IP that we pulled from the file at the beginning of class, so the one that I copied into my notes, um, that's 71. And then the destination port is 444. I'd like to redirect it, and I'll just put 8444 right here. So I'm going to do this. And then I'm going to um, source. And then I can do IP tables dash T nav dash power. If I do that, it allows me to see that that's in there. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to reset this again. So just same thing I did before. I hit the rewind button and then I click OK. This verifies that that firewall rule is in place. And then the next thing I'm going to do is I'm sending, I'm redirecting all the traffic here. And it actually puts this in a much more kind of human readable format than the arguments were on the IP tables command line. So I can listen for incoming traffic on that using netcat just like we did way back when. Um, and then hopefully this works. Yeah. And look at that. I have my I have a reverse shell that's part of the revolution backdoor, right? I can do I think help. And look, I get the help menu from Revolution. So all those strings that you saw that were in the Revolution backdoor, um, now I'm using those. And the neat thing about this approach that I did here is I didn't have to go into the Revolution backdoor and manually modify the IP address that was stored in there. And also I didn't have to change the IP address scheme in my VirtualBox networking lab, right? The only thing I really had to do was on that one Windows machine um, that was running the backdoor. I just had to make sure that it's forwarding a copy of all of its traffic to the Linux system. And then as far as the backdoor is concerned, it's talking to the bad guy right now. And you can even see the uh, Wireshark traffic right here. 